Welcome to High Stakes, episode 38. I'm your host, Neil Orfield. You can find me on Twitter at PlayerQDFS. High Stakes is produced by Mike Lawrence. You can find him on Twitter at AwesomeYo. And I'm here today with Vince Willa, a.k.a. Tinderella DFS on Twitter, Tinderella on DraftKings or FanDuel. If you've been playing for any period of time, you probably know Vince's handle. He's won six figures in NBA, MLB, NFL. He's been a successful player for several years, and he is, a, according to his Twitter bio, a 15-time live finalist in DFS. Very impressive resume for Vince. Vince, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm good. How are you, Neil? I'm good as well. I'm, I'm happy to have you on the show. I uh, appreciate you coming on, of course. Um, I love the screen name, Tinderella. I mean, it's, it's one that stands out. Like I, 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 you know, it's one of those that's kind of memorable. Uh, tell me about it. What, what is what is the background? I mean, it seems kind of obvious, I guess, what where you came up with the name. But uh, is there is there anything to it? Were you on Tinder at the time that you decided to make the screen name? Is there any story behind it? Yeah, well, the optics of Tinder addict was pretty bad, so <laughs> I decided to go with Tinderella. Oh uh, no, I mean, it was just like a meme, you know. So I made my screen name in 2014, and. It was like big at the time and I wanted to be something sort of like catchy and topical. And that's kind of the gist of it. Like when I go to live finals, I don't know what people are expecting, but, you know, I'm just a poker dork sort of like everyone else. So is Tinder not big anymore? I, I just I guess I, I've been uh, I've been married for a while now and, and started dating my wife, you know, eight years ago. So I, I you know, haven't really known the scene anymore. Is Tinder not still the thing? I guess I, I guess I don't know if you know that either. We don't need to get uh, we don't need to get personal about uh, yeah, I don't want to like out myself too much. But from what I can tell, people are like sliding Instagram at this point. OK. Int- oh, yeah. Cutting the middleman. It's not it's not just professional athletes. Interesting. Um, yeah, all right. No. Uh, how about uh, I, I like to start by asking, like, where are you from? What sports teams or athletes are you a fan of? Are those things related? Uh, so start start with that. Where where are you from? What what teams or athletes are you a fan of? Uh, so I grew up in South Florida, and uh, I'm a big Heat fan. And I recently gave up the Dolphins, um, and that's pretty much it. Like you know, at this point, like becoming a full adult, your like fandom starts to wane. And you know, I love the Heat, and yeah, that's the gist of it. I don't think that's true for all adults. I think there are still some some adults who are big time super fans of uh, certain teams. Uh, are, are you still in Florida? I'm in Arizona right now, but I'm in Florida like half the time. So okay, and you haven't you haven't adopted the Arizona teams uh, as far as fandom goes? Uh, so no, not exactly. I mean, when my buddies are rooting for their team, I'll like join in a little bit, but like my heart's not really into it. I suppose. Okay. So really, so just the heat at this point, you said that you gave up on the dolphins. You're not like a Marlins fan. It's, it's just the heat for you. Yeah. I mean, like, um, the other teams have just been so bad for so long. Um, that yeah, just, it, it, it's not clicking anymore. All right. And that's, that's unfortunate as we were talking about a little bit before the show, I'm, I'm of course, uh, a Jimmy Butler hater to, to some of the, I, 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 maybe it's, maybe that's not entirely like, I feel like I would like Jimmy Butler. I'll probably like Jimmy Butler after he retires, but he's like the villain that I've chosen because of the way he left the Timberwolves. I'm like, I'm always, I'm cheering against Jimmy Butler because of the way he left the Timberwolves and shat all over the entire organization on his way out. So, uh, well, I mean, he was know. right though. He's, he he's literally been. winning with the third stringers, like as we speak. Like he's somewhere off in the world. See, all right. See, that people. was that was the story that pissed me off the most because he comes out, he goes, he runs, he runs off to Rachel Nichols, tells her the story of, oh, I beat the starters with the third stringers. And then it comes out after the fact that like they the, the starters wanted to play again. And Jimmy Butler ran off the court it was like, we're not doing it again. There's also stories that like he didn't score a single point in that game. It was all the third stringers who scored all the points. So the way I'm picturing this is. You know, the, Jimmy Butler and the third stringers take on the starters and the starters are like, yeah, whatever. It's practice, not really caring that much. And then after the fact, Jimmy Butler just talks all of his shit to them and they're like, all right, let's do it again. And he's like, nope, not not doing it again. So that's that's just sort of my like my impression of Jimmy Butler is that he's just. Uh, yeah, but then he, he did it literally in the playoffs this year. <laughs> kind of. I mean, other than I, Bam, that's, no, no, Tyler other than Harrow, Bam, I guess those are the third stringers, right? I guess I guess that is uh, that there is there is some truth to that. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's the only thing I very good. Everything else, I'm like super agnostic about my sports. I'm like, oh, well, the market has this, that, and the other. But then when it comes to the heat, like, I'll be like, well, you know, we've got the culture and we've got Spo. So, like, you know, put anyone in that system and we're going to be good. You've got the culture? Like, I mean. Well, you know, like the heat culture cliche. You, you mean, so you mean the, the the team itself, not the, uh, not like the fan base, I assume? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, like, right. 
basically they sign people who are out of shape and just whip them into, you know, solid NBA players. Yeah, it's been it's been very successful. Clearly, a uh, a team, a, a franchise that knows what they're doing. Uh, they should probably time. do that with stars, though, rather than third stringers. But well, you you were just telling me. I mean, you you alluded to they're a pinch, uh, potentially in the sweepstakes for Dame Lillard. Uh, yeah, they they are. The issue is, I don't think it's going to be a sweepstakes. I think he's just going to stick around with Portland because it seems like he can get easily convinced that they're still going to try and compete with him. And to be honest, like. Players are aging pretty well these days. And even if they're not like top tier contenders next year or the year after, you know, maybe in like three years um, with Scoot and if they like fill out the roster pretty well, like they can probably be okay. So it's, it's maybe not insane. I mean, like, so LeBron used to be on the heat, right? And he has always taken these like very short views when managing his career and his teams are screwed by like year three or four. Like every single time they just run out of gas because they're like too old and they haven't developed enough players. So there's definitely some value to sticking with an organization and like letting them do their thing and like take the long view and and compete as well as they can, even if there's like a few down years along the way. But I assume you like so I would say even though LeBron takes the short view, like it's worked out for him. He's winning championships everywhere he goes. Like I I assume as a as a Heat fan, are you happy with the way things went there? Well, LeBron. first off, yes, it was awesome. Yeah, it was incredible. Other than like everyone berating us for years about sure the way he came, it was it was a lot of fun. But um, I think LeBron's run under EV with championships don't don't you think so? Like in terms of winning the championships, I mean, I think he should have won more in his career based on how good he is. I guess I yeah he, he's been to the finals so many times. He's taken some good teams and some not so good teams there. I don't know. It's I, I I'm guessing Vince that you're not a guy who argues that like he's less good than Michael Jordan because he's lost in the finals. You know, people make that argument of like, yeah, oh, no, well, he has, so. yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. Like how many is it one? Four or five? Four. Okay. Four. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. You can really expect much more than that. I mean, Giannis has one, like what, what superstars really like, there's not that many that win more than four. I don't know. It's a, it's an interesting argument. Like I, I'm not sure if he's if he's one less. Yeah, but, but Giannis is like top twenty ever. LeBron's like one or two. True. It's a pretty big difference. That is a pretty big difference. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to think about that. Like if you told me like that anybody the the term, and I guess as you say the, the the best potentially the best player, arguably the best player ever, is different than like your usual conversation. But like if you tell me that a player is going to win four championships in their career as the best player in the league, I'd be like that is a player that uh, it's hard, it's hard to argue for me that that is underperforming. But but I see your point. Like it is it's it's a it's tough uh, when when you're talking about that top tier of like you know the best mm-hmm. player ever potentially. I, I guess you you might have a point. Um, all right. Should we get into talking a little bit of DFS? Or actually, I, I like I prefer to start just talking a little bit about your background and uh, you know what kind of DFS player you are. So starting with, what kind of background do you have in statistics? Do you have any formal or informal training? No, I mean, um, a lot of DFS players understand you know the game very well or understand stats very well, or they'll go on shows like this and they'll be very opaque and be like, oh, I have a model. <laughs> the model tells me what to do. I, I wish I could do that, but uh, I'm sort of just a regular dude who um, has played a lot of games competitively over a lot of years and have taken my fair share of L's along the way and have learned from them just enough to to still be you know somewhat relevant in this space. All right. Uh, so so no no formal training in statistics, I and mean, we'll, we'll get into uh, that the process a little bit more as well, like your your unique process. Uh, how about uh, computer programming? Same thing, like no no uh, formal training there. Twenty twenty one, I had a New Year's resolution to learn Python, and I like wiped out within like five days. It wasn't great. I still tell myself I'm going to learn Python and like just enough so that I can use ChatGPT to to do things for me. I haven't done it though. Like so far, I, I have not found found the use for it either. <laughs> Welcome um, to the club. Yeah. Uh, what about professional background uh, prior to DFS or any related hobbies? Um, so I started playing poker in college and then, uh, that became my career until black Friday. Like, I don't know how plug 
and you are with uh what, what was the date of black like i'm familiar with black friday i don't it was april 2011 okay yeah i was i was actually playing the same stakes as uh alex awesome uh for a bit um i was better than him but he's better than me at tfs which seems like the way to do it <laughs> he's so um, at tfs yeah exactly exactly uh so yeah you know that was that was a really good run and it was it was really short in hindsight like my dfs dfs career is more than twice as long as my poker career so who knows what would have happened if um it stuck around in the states but so you, you so you say you uh you you were a pro poker professional until black friday in 2000 so so like when did you when did you graduate college if you don't mind me asking oh nine coming oh nine. so so just a couple years there as, yeah. a, as, as a poker pro okay yeah uh, and then what, what happened after black friday because then you can't really play poker anymore is my i mean it's there was there was like poker. a three-year period where i attempted to have a real job and okay then, then i found dfs instead and it was it was way more up my alley because like in terms of like the money i was making playing poker was just so much worse in the real world it was hard to get motivated for it sure all right so so you had a real job for about three years, and then you discovered DFS in 2014. Is that about right? Yeah, football season 2014. Okay, I know that you you created your uh, your RG profile in 2014. I had seen that. Of course, it's okay. empty. You you deleted your your uh, your screen names from there, so I can't see any of your stats there. But it was at least created in 2014. Um, so so the timeline is is checking out here. Um, and and what what drew you in in to DFS in 2014? Well, to be honest, at first, I assumed DFS was unbeatable because of the rake. Um, because I knew that sports betting was extremely competitive at 10% rake. And then I saw DFS was 15%. I'm like, okay, well, I don't have to worry about this. Um, and then basically the gist of it is there were so many... I, I was uh, I played poker also with uh, E. Hafner, Eric Hafner. Yep. And there were so many E. Hafner commercials at the time on radio and TV. Like I eventually stumbled into having a conversation with him and, and he's like, oh no, this is actually like very beatable. And obviously in hindsight, when the tournaments are so top heavy, 15% rake is like not a problem. Um, but at the time I thought it was, I thought it was prohibitive. Yeah. It's also, I mean, the, the level of the competition that you're playing against with that 15% rake versus playing against the books, which are, you'd obviously play, you'd rather exactly. play against so like when, your average Joe. Go ahead. When you're taking a sports bet, like, Worst case scenario, you're getting your money in 45%, but some people are entering lineups that are more or less stone dead. So right. that that rate gets spilled up pretty quickly. Okay. And were, were you a winning player right away? Um, I think it took me till baseball season to like actually gain some traction of that year. Um. You know, it was it was sort of the Wild West back then. Like people were running trains, right? You know, no problem. Like Sean Zon, Sean Jean, who works for you guys, he used to just enter a hundred fifty man train in basketball and like min cash or better every single time, and it like wasn't a problem. Like th this was really a nostalgic period for me. Yeah. Um. So I I was quite bad. Uh. In fact, like. I'm I'm not very good at learning games right away. Like when I play board games with my friends, I'm like completely average in the beginning. But like usually over time, like I crack the code a little bit more and more. Um, so, you know, by the time baseball season came around, that was a little bit more on my alley because you didn't actually have to know too much about how good players were. You would just like stack teams. And like that meta was like kind of a printer for a while. That's interesting. So I so I I just learned. So somebody asked me this a couple of days ago when I started playing MLB DFS. And yesterday was actually the the 10 year anniversary of when I started playing MLB DFS. And I don't remember if I was full stacking. I, I would assume that I was not full stacking unless the content related to it uh like encouraged stacking. I, I like I think that I would have intuitively known about like, oh yeah, there's correlation. So it's like good to have batters back to back, but I don't know that I necessarily would have like right away intuitively known to full stack like five man stack four man stacks do you, do you think you just like knew intuitively like i need to be stacking this game it wasn't an intuitive thing i jonathan bales had a book at the time okay yeah. uh fantasy baseball for i forget if it was smart people or dumb people 
I think it's for dumb people. I think I, own, of, I think I own the book. I have not read it. One of the two. And like, obviously it's outdated now. Um, he seems to be pretty good at like cracking the code on stuff very early on. Yeah. Whereas I, it usually takes me time to, to learn stuff. So uh, that book was super helpful. Um, and, and to be honest, it could be summarized in a page, you know, um, but um, that was all you needed back then. It was, it was stack a team and, and you're good to go. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like you're kind of a hands-on learner. I'm, I'm, I'm the same way. Like I'm not a particularly quick learner. I wouldn't say I'm, I'm definitely like, I need to get my reps in. I need to like start doing something to be able to start thinking 100%. about it so intensely. To circle back to my poker career, when I, when I first started out, I was basically playing like somewhat loose and somewhat passive and was like a break even player. And then like over time, I, I realized that all I had to do was tighten up a bunch and I would have just better hands than everyone else on every single street. And I didn't even have to be better poker players than them. I just always had a slightly better hand. Um, and obviously poker was very easy back then, just like TFS was easy in the beginning. But, you know, that was how it started. That's how I got my career going. And then over time, slowly but surely, I learned how to punch and counter punch and how to like manipulate the situation to, you know, at this point, poker is quite tough. Like, could I hold my own? Maybe, but it's like very, very complex now for sure. Do you think your background as a poker player has helped with your DFS career? So there's nothing that's directly translatable. One thing that's been extremely helpful with poker is that it's essentially similar to DFS and that there's a lot of money to be made, but it started 10 years earlier. Yep. And so what I mean by that is um, poker sort of like in its late game of being solved. And one of the interesting things that's happened over the last couple of years is that they've implemented uh, sol literally solvers, like poker solvers, to teach you exactly how to play. And what it's done is shown that very often the like last bit of edge to be found is taking things to their complete logical extreme. So for example, back in the day, if you had a pot size of like 100 chips, people would generally bet between like 40 and 80. You know, they'd bet 40 if the board didn't have a lot of draws and they would bet 80 if the board was really wet and then they would check otherwise. But now the solver will be like, oh, it's like totally fine to bet 10% of the pot. And that will whittle down someone's range, aka the possible hands they can have, to a certain subset, and then you can manipulate that on future streets. Or they'll even bet twice the size of the pot, be like, hey, this board is so much better for me, I'm just going to jam a lot of money in, and you have almost no recourse against it. So for example, there's some situations where one player versus the other, one simply cannot have base king because they would re-raise or re-re-raise three bet or four bet with it. Like say the flop comes queen, jack, 10, and one player doesn't have ace, king. The other player can just like bet pot, over bet turn, jam river every single time. And essentially the other player has to call occasionally with just like top pair and a blocker to having a straight. Um, and that's sort of a move that no one would ever take like intuitively in poker because it's just so off off the grid but it's really taking one piece of logic it, where it's very difficult to have something on that board and taking it to such an extreme that you can really hyper exploit your opponents do you still play poker um not in the last year but i would mess around on like bovada uh especially during the pandemic when sports wasn't happening games were really good for a while um and yeah for the most part there's a decent amount of people doing stuff like that but not enough that okay um at least in those stakes you have to be worried about it and i i assume like so that's obviously something that you use for online poker i wonder if like there's more edge to be had in like in-person poker i assume like go into a poker room you'd have more edge than playing online do you uh I mean, I guess maybe you'd just be guessing if that's the case. Probably depends on where you're going. But has that been your experience that it's a little bit softer playing in person? It's softer in person, but like it's basically because there's a cost to going to a casino and getting a table and that sort of stuff. And online you can multi-table, right? So 
Um, at, at, there's not anything inherently easier about playing in person or harder about playing online. It's just a matter of um, the amount of seats that are available to a certain amount of people. So do you think that DFS is following the same path essentially as poker? Like, where do you think we are in terms of like how solved DFS is? That's a good question. So poker got dinged by bad legislation early on, whereas legislation has been favorable for DFS. I think for the most part, we're still in like 2010 poker. So like pretty early on still. Just because like there's still people redepositing with their credit card constantly. It's 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 not a big problem to get people to redeposit. In terms of how it's different or, or how it's harder, it's um there used to be like clearly printing strategies that are now actively bad. Can you give me some and, examples? Yeah, I can bring one from my career specifically. So I, I crushed baseball in 2017 and 2016. I was one of the first players to implement. I mean, like I'm not giving away any trade secrets. I don't think here. One of the first players to implement the four, four double stack on FanDuel. Yeah. People were not doing it beforehand because you would have to like shoehorn in some like sketchy seven hitter. Right. And people just weren't willing to do that. So they would stack one lineup and then have good op good one-offs in like the rest of the lineup, right? Yep. But uh the 4-4 was quite brilliant in terms of how it exploited both um correlation and low ownership while like barely giving up any projection. Um so so for those two years, you could essentially upload um vanilla projections tell fantasy crunch or whatever your optimizer is to run four fours or if they didn't have four fours just force them in um and and you would print like it wouldn't be perfect every day but it was just a completely winning strategy and i was like okay well this is how you beat baseball you just stack and then you know print but no i mean like people adjusted 2018 everyone was doing it and i got destroyed i was down that was my only losing year and um at first, like as as a gambler, you're like, okay, you know, this is a bad run. You know, this is going to turn around. Like my pitchers aren't doing well. My my stacks are breaking, blah, 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 blah. But I was duping all over the place. And, um, you know, essentially it took time to realize like, okay, like I have to play the ownership game a little bit. I have to find lineups that are uncomfortable for one way or another. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think I'm like particularly good at now is like there will be a lineup with a certain projection and ownership and there will be another lineup with a certain projection and ownership. And I think very often one lineup will be better than the other. And I think I have a good grasp of why. Um, okay. Are you, are you going to give away that edge or are you, are you just, uh, I will, I will give it away just a little bit and I'll give it away in, in the football stuff. Um, there's, there's a good example of Millie maker winners in the last five years from like two DFS superstars. So one goes back to, uh, Cal Spears. He won the just lotto Millie maker back in the day. And this was, um, a CJ Bathard and Kittle stack. Okay. Yep. Super cheap. It was like 5k CJ Bathard, 3k Kittle. There was a Colts run back for like 3k. And then he shoehorned in the like top three receivers and had the optimal the rest of the way, like top three receivers on the slate. So it was like Antonio Brown, AJ Green and uh, Julio Jones at the time. Good right. Memory. So like this is like yeah. 2018. Um, and so that lineup, you know, it was just a stack and an oppo and, you know, it was sort of normal, but an optimizer is never really getting to that one because each receiver gave up like a couple points from optimal. But what he did there, that's like, I don't know. I mean, maybe he just stumbled into it, but what he did there that in my opinion is quite brilliant is that um, people view a DFS lineup as a correlated parlay, right? And that's why stacking is good. Mm -hmm. But he sort of had a tighter parlay in that he was essentially betting on receivers versus running backs. 
in that situation, right? So like, whereas other people will stack an oppo, which needs to hit, and then their other six one-ups need to hit, he was more correlating a smaller group of things that needs to hit less frequently. And so I thought that lineup in particular, the way it was constructed, was shooting was shoehorning in necessary conditions in such a way that he was extremely plus EV while not giving up too much projection and having reasonable ownership. When you say oppo, do you mean a run back? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So that's uh that's one one example. And then I thought you had one other example you were going to. And then I do have one other one. The other one would be with with Alex himself, Osimo, his millimaker win two years ago, I think now. Sounds right. Um yeah, it has to be because Amon Ra St. Brown was in it. He ran a um Russell Wilson. Do you know who their running back was back then on the Seahawks? On the Seahawks two years ago. Was it Rashad Penny? It might have been Penny. And then Metcalf and Lockett, Amon Ross St. Brown, they're playing each other. It was a uh, Seahawks Lions game. And okay. then I think there might have even been one other line pass catcher. So he literally had seven players or six players, whatever that is, from the same game. And um, so he's essentially playing also a three legged parlay there or four legged yeah. parlay, much fewer parlays. And he's making the bet that. Okay, this one game is going to go off for 70. Everything else is going to stay under 50. And I just have to get the other stuff like somewhat right and and I'll be okay. Um so they're they're both they're like essentially completely opposite, but they're a way of making a parlay that's um you know, so many people are just running the the double stack uh with someone on the other side. Yep. And that was a very good meta for a while but it's, it's quite overrated now um, when people are essentially playing the same strategy, just like the four fours in baseball became quite overrated. Um, and I, I think picking up on stuff like that across a couple different sports is essentially a good way or a microcosm of my edge overall. I think that was a, a same the same way that uh, Hoop twenty four ten won his millie this year was like way game stacked one certain game. I think yep. it was like it was a chalky game, but then like nobody else was stacking it to the extent that he was. So another way to like kind of the same approach as Alex is over stacking that one game in a way that other people weren't really. I want to get back to to the four fours just a little bit though. So so you're saying that your edge was doing four fours. Are you still like? Do you still think that four fours are? plus EV, you just have to do different lineup types? Or are you saying that you don't run four fours on FanDuel anymore? I definitely still run four fours. Okay. Um, you just have to be a little careful with it. There, It's very very often that like, there will be a chalk stack that's like super comfortable with a four four. Yep. Because all the players will have like a linear price range. They'll be like 2.8K to 3.2K and they'll fit in like a variety of positions. So they're just populating your optimizer left and right. And, and they just don't justify that kind of ownership. Um, they're, they're just not good enough. Okay. So it's not, it's not that you're saying that the construction is wrong. You're saying that you have to kind of factor in ownership. Like back in 2017. I'm, I'm still stacking quite a bit in, in baseball across both sites. Okay. Um, I think that's unavoidable. All right. You're just saying that in 2017, at that point, you don't even have to really factor in ownership that much. Whereas now it was a like blind print fest. Yeah. Right. So now it's like you're still generally stacking like as much as possible, but you're just not uh, you're not doing it blindly anymore. Now you're, you're taking stands as far as early, you're making mm -hmm. decisions relative to ownership with within those stacks. OK. Yep. And are you so so? Uh, just getting back to your uh, career a little bit, you said that you've been doing DFS uh, like twice as long as poker, but it se seems like you've been playing for longer. Are you a professional DFS player now? Like, is that your is it your full time job? Yep. Okay, and how how long has that been the case? Twenty fifteen. Okay, so a long time, man. That you're you're one of the probably probably the longest term like DFS pros who are doing it as your primary source of income. Not many people, I think, dating back to two thousand fifteen. So that's very impressive. Um, in, in which sport or sports would you say you have the biggest edge? It's a good question. Um, basketball is 
probably the lowest variance. Um, and I, but I think football is the highest ROI. But I, I personally prefer baseball because it's it's hard to screw up too much, and the edge is still decent enough that, um, and the season is long enough that. I almost always end up good except for that, that one year that went sideways because I was overconfident in the process. Um, so yeah, I mean, they all have their pluses and their minuses and, and what you say about one sport doesn't necessarily apply to the other and vice versa. Right. So a lot of it, a lot of this stuff for me is, is just experience getting my reps in same thing with poker was just getting a lot of hands in slowly improving, slowly improving. I mean, in, in this stuff, I'm, I'm never going to be top 10. In poker, I was never playing high stakes, but there, there's plenty of action below that. And, um, you know, just do the best you can. There's room for more than just the top 10 to make some money. Yeah. Yeah, basically. W would you say that your, your poker career has helped with like managing the swings of DFS and or like your bankroll management? Nothing like Not that? Not at all. Poker, poker was so much easier because I played cash games. And for the most part... Um, I would go on like a two week downswing whereas in, in, and it would be like one five hundredth of my bankroll. Whereas in DFS, I'll go on, you know, four month down year long downswings when it was really bad, but like four month downswings and, and lose, you know, my entire yearly winnings up until a certain point. And, uh, yeah, that can be really tough. And especially in football where it's once a week. Um, and there's so much content surrounding it. It really actually stresses me out because it makes me feel like I'm constantly making a mistake. Like, oh no, like people played this play. Like that must've been the answer, even though I wasn't on it. Like, why am I such an idiot, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, it's, it's, to me, it's way tougher to handle the swings in, in DFS. Um, especially because like once the slate is over, you, you can't get back at it and, and test yourself again. That's a good point. There's no like, okay, I'm going to, I just lost that one. I'm going to go on to the next one. Like you have to, at the very least, every sport, like you have to generally wait for the next day at least. Um, so it's, it's a little bit different. W yeah. Would you say that uh, poker is the best analogy for DFS anyway? Like when people talk about like the, like how, what, what is the edge like in DFS? And like, is it just luck? Is there skill involved? I tend to tell people like, I think it's most similar to poker where like on any given hand, like there's a ton of luck involved, but over the long haul skill, skillful players are going to make money. Would you agree with that in general? Yeah, that's more or less fair. Um, I think it's, I think DFS is just simply higher variance. Yeah. And um, you, you in poker for the most part, you have to be pretty good to win a tournament still. Whereas sure. in DFS, it's certainly conceivable to Christmas tree something and and do okay. To Christmas tree something, I've, I've never yeah, heard like this. you know, on know. like a scantron, you just like fill in blindly. Oh yeah, all right, yeah, that's funny. Just yeah, like I mean, players. yeah, you, you see, you see bad lineups winning, not all the time, but like kind of all the time, like pretty pretty regularly. You see a lineup, you're like, how did they come up with that lineup? I've, I've won with bad lineups before. <laughs> we We've just all... didn't know it at the time. Right, exactly. Yeah, lineups. We all get better over time. Yeah, that's a good point, though. Yeah, yeah you're, you're probably not gonna win in poker like playing just horribly, whereas in in DFS you can, like at, at least on one given slate. But still, like over over the long term, if you continue to play those bad lineups, you're probably gonna give it all back, right? Like in general. Yeah, um, but if your bank is big enough, you'll you'll realize before you lose it. True. True. Let me take a minute away from this conversation with Vince to tell you about Stochastic's latest innovation in the world of DFS, MLB Sims. This cutting edge tool is set to revolutionize the way you approach lineup building. With MLB Sims, you can now simulate lineups against each other thousands of times, unlocking unprecedented insights and in-depth metrics that enable you to identify the best lineups. This tool is unlike anything currently on the market. Simply upload a lineup CSV and with a click of a button, simulate the upcoming slate thousands of times with Stochastic's proprietary MLB simulation technology. Easily determine the best stacks, individual players, and lineup construction that leads to high ROI lineups. This tool is set to change the game. Don't fall behind. Get your edge today with Stochastic MLB Sims. Visit Stochastic.com for more details. All right. Uh... So we, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about process. Uh, we got the, w when I asked for questions from listeners, Choke Holdem came in right away and said he wanted to hear about your process. Uh, so we'll, we'll go over my usual questions and then see if there's anything else uh, about your process that you can 
giveaway here, but starting with, uh, do you do any simulations on your own or use simulations from outside sources as part of your process? Nope. Do you use an optimizer? Yeah. Yeah. You max contest. I guess I could, could have probably assumed that. Um, yeah, uh, the optimizer is dangerous though. Like a lot of the edge and DFS now is exploiting people who use it incorrectly. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that, that's been the case, I think for several years now. Yeah. I'm oh. yeah. Yeah. Um, do you create your own projections from scratch? Um, depends on the board. For the most okay. part, I just shape projections that exist. Okay. Which is exactly, exactly what I do. Yep. Uh, when you say you shape projections, I mean, you, you take the projection and you say, I want a little bit more of this guy. I'm going to give him a one point boost or whatever. I want a little bit less of this guy. I'm going to give him a two point haircut, that kind of thing. Or yeah, for the most part. Okay. Um, do you create your own ownership projections from scratch? Uh, no, but I'll, I'll override some stuff sometimes, uh, especially like, um, for the, I, I believe there's in general a leak in the, um, overall DFS content space where they're all creating stuff for smaller stakes, but for mid stakes, like these guys get steamed like crazy. So you have to be a little bit careful about uh taking those ownership projections at face value when you know the good pitcher is 60 percent instead of 30. can you define mid stakes for me um it's like 500 dollars plus or minus okay. a few hundred <laughs> all right right so that's to me that's am, like, I, am i off <laughs> no i i have no idea to me that is high stakes like if you're if it's 500 dollar buy-in that'd be high stakes in my book but i i think that i i, I like my bread and butter is like the the largest field contest so it's like the mm -hmm. or you know like the, the standard one the 15 dollars in baseball typically whatever um so to me that's like that is qualifies as almost mid stakes but it, it's probably it's probably fair to say because like there are also contests that are five thousand dollar buy-in or twenty five thousand dollar buy-in that yeah that's, those are that's clearly... high stakes because like there there are some of these ballers who are playing with like empire maker and like three mans and four mans I don't know. Maybe there's money to be made, but it's it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of money to invest. Do you do you play in high stakes ever? Like what what you consider high stakes? Pretty much no. Um, I, I I think it might be worth it in football. Football really brings out quite a bit of money. Um, but in the other sports, it's like a little dicey, un unless you're like a real crusher. And I'm a little bit conservative in terms of bankroll management. Okay. So you play, I mean, it, it like what, what you call mid stakes, as I said, like I, I would generally call $500 buy-in like that to me is, is high stakes. So you're not, not exactly a nit, but maybe, maybe yeah. you know, just going <laughs> to enough. that, that top level in terms of uh, the, the high stakes that you're playing at. Um, how much does, I, I guess we've kind of talked about this a little bit, how much does ownership play a role for you in creating your lineups? Um, it, it obviously matters quite a bit. I think if you're just sorting your lineups by ownership, you're doing yourself a disservice. And I, I've touched on this earlier with the um, lineups I described by by Cal and Alex, where um, I think for the most part, you want to more avoid combinations that are so extraordinarily chalky that they're almost untenable. So last night, for example, if you played Otani and Coors, like I don't think you could have made a plus EV lineup with with Otani and the Dodgers. I I I, I would be surprised if it's possible. I mean, the slate was so big, and those those guys got so much ownership that you know. I mean, maybe I let a lineup like that sneak through, but it's probably not very good. Sure. Um, but you could have played some stuff that was relatively high owned, but if it's like quirky in one way or another, just to something that the average person isn't going to pick up on, like it's probably okay, even if it, um, you know, is over 125% owned or whatever your cap is. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure that I played some Dodgers with Otani. So I'm not 100% sure of that, but I would guess that I had some like Dodger stack with Otani. My example for yesterday was uh, Brian Wu. So it was like the, the combination of also a somewhat chalky pitcher, but also he was cheap. So he allowed you to get up to, the Dodgers, whereas it was maybe a little bit more difficult to do the Otani with the Dodgers, but clearly people were doing I, it. I think so, but like Otani also forced you to 
shoehorn in some certain value bets where I, if you played Wu and Peterson, you at least could have had like three really contrarian one-offs like Acuna and whatever, like Acuna was 4%. So true. True. I mean, obviously he also hit two home runs. So I'm like playing the results a little bit here, but right. Right. You know, but nobody will remember that by the time this comes out on Friday, people are going to be like, what are these guys even talking about? Yeah. True. yeah. But Dod- Dodgers and Coors uh, last night looked, looked very good, but, uh, also clearly got a lot of ownership. So that's a good point. So, so you, it obviously, as you said, it plays a role, but like, you're not just trying to play the most contrarian lineup. You're trying to play, would you say kind of a balanced approach where like you're playing, you're willing to eat some chalk, but it really comes down to uh, like how much ownership are they getting versus how likely are they to hit a high projection kind of, um, I guess I'm just trying to figure out exactly what you mean by like, don't just, don't just sort by ownership. What, what do you sort by, I guess? Well, I don't really script as much as I used to. I'm, I'm doing a lot of hand builds. So okay. a lot of it is feel and just understanding what an optimizer would push you to. If I were using optimizers quite a bit, which I do for basketball because it's a little bit more forgiving on dupes and stuff like that, um, you know, then maybe I would have to skim off some ownership here and there and do what other people are doing because you're, you're juggling so many lineups at that point that you can't go through every single one and be like, Oh, okay. Does this have like a good thesis? Does this one have a good thesis, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. Like yeah. you have to, and, and that's why like, it's always so silly when people are like, Oh, you had 150 lineups and, and that's why you won. It's like, I can promise you it's the fastest way to lose money. You will, if you, if you screw up even a little bit, you will get destroyed scripting. You will get absolutely annihilated. You have to take a position on every single player in the entire market when you're scripting every single last one. Whereas if you're hand building a little bit and playing mid stakes or high stakes for you, um, <laughs> like you can have zero percent of of you know cores last night, right? And it's it's not necessarily like an insane stand. Like you only made a few lineups, right? That's true. Yeah, it's a, it's a entirely different game. Um, w- would you call yourself an exploitative player? trying to take advantage of the field's mistakes. Yeah, because honestly, I don't have that much else going for me. Like I said before, um, I'm not like an incredible quant. I'm, I'm slow on picking up actual like hand in the dirt sports stuff. Like um, I, I, I didn't see Patrick Mahomes coming. I didn't see Shohei Otani coming. I didn't see all these generational players becoming a thing. Like, Right. For the most part, projections are quite good right now. Um, and you're going to have a hard time out of projecting people. It's certainly possible, but it's hard. Um, but you can outplay them by being exploitative. Are you, do, do you watch the games? Like, are you a, a sports fan? Like, is that part of your like enjoyment of DFS or is that, are you just like a, a numbers and game theory guy? I, I hate watch them. Like, <laughs> It's just really frustrating because obviously you're losing like three out of four days or whatever the number is. Um, so that's just not a, that's just not a fun feeling. Um, I'll, I'll force myself to do it pretty often, but I don't enjoy it. I mean, thank you for baseball and, and golf. You don't really have to. It's like when all on the s- numbers for the most part. When you say that you force yourself to do it, is that because you think that you can learn something that will be helpful in DFS or um, just because you're already playing, you feel like you should be watching. Uh, no, it's definitely for learning. Um, so specifically in like basketball, some like rotation stuff and some matchup stuff is important. And then in football, um, it's just such a small sample size and it's very difficult to like capture every single thing that's going on into a projection into their like final number. Like, what does that final number mean? Because a lot of these projection sites, they just give you a number. And it's like, okay, well, yeah. how are you coming up with that? Um, so, like, understanding how they come up with that uh, will give you some insight as to whether it's a good play or not. Okay. Uh, and, I mean, I, I asked you about whether you do your own projections. You said that it sort of depends on the sport. It sounds like for basketball, do you do your own minutes projections? Like, if you're, if you're studying the rotations and stuff, is that something where you are going in and maybe uh adjusting or maybe just like yeah partially adjusting. But, it's, but it's like nine and a half out of ten times i let it let it fly okay 
because like occasionally you'll think, all right, I think that there's maybe uh, that yeah. the range of outcomes skews this way or skews that way in terms of minutes. So then you'll adjust a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is avoiding being duplicated by other players a big part of your strategy in any contest these days? I think it has to be. Um, obviously, this doesn't apply to Showdown. And Showdown is one of the two forms of DFS I've never been a winner in. Uh, so Showdown and just golf in general. Uh, golf, I think I'm on the path to winning at, and I've just had a bad run, bad run. But Showdown is probably like one one spot where like a incredibly good quant could have a huge edge because so much of the EV is just avoiding dupes. And especially in a sport like football, like how crazy can you go? Can you play captain running back and then his backup in a lineup? Can you leave 7,000 on the table? I think for the most part, like it really depends on um, the specific game that's going on at that time. Uh, because some yeah. teams are so concentrated and have their usage in a certain way. And I don't know, we all used to make fun of Siege for telling us to play backup quarterbacks, right? Yeah. And then since he's done that, the backup has played like 10% of like primetime games, something insane. And like, I don't know, like, like I said before with poker, taking things to their logical extreme is generally the last bit of edge that's available in these uh, solvable in poker and pseudo solvable, pseudo solvable in DFS games. Um, so I, I imagine there's still a lot of edge in that, and I, I just don't think I'm capable of extracting it at this point. And I'm more or less happy to let it slide, although I do play occasionally for fun. You know, it's funny you, you bring up the the siege example. That's something that I was doing like before I ever like was involved in any of the commentary in DFS. Before I really consumed that much content related to to showdown, I think it was like. All right, so the backup quarterback, nobody's playing it. You really only need one thing to, I mean, you do need more than one thing to go right, but like generally the quarterback is going to score a good amount of fantasy points. And it used to be like the quarterback was cheap. Like they would put the the backup quarterback down at $6,000 on DraftKings or something. So it was like, all right, so nobody's going to play this guy. So then there were, there were certain scenarios where it's like, you know, the quarterback is coming in with a little bit of bum, bum ankle. It was something that I used to, to do occasionally. Like I just throw one lineup in there. Like what if the, the, the starting quarterback does get hurt? Because it seems like in a field size as large as you get in nfl shadow 200 000 lineups or whatever it is like well this is one of the quickest way to cut through the field is the starting quarterback goes down the backup quarterback comes in if it's early enough he's probably going to have success and nobody else is going to have him so i never thought i never thought it was that crazy of a take by siege um it is it's it's funny the way people <laughs> make fun of him but um you know it's and, it, and it's actually not something that i do these days it's something that i used to do in part because i i have had success in showdown uh in just implementing different strategies so I, I stopped doing that but i don't think it is i don't think it's the craziest thing to do um in in showdown uh i, I assume when, when you say like when you're referring to showdown you just mean nfl showdown or are you talking about like yeah I was, I was talking more about nfl because it's it's specifically has really big contests and and they're like in basketball the the dupes are unavoidable in the big showdowns like it's it's literally right. impossible but uh in football you will see million dollar wins on showdown yeah. um and and so like yeah that, that that's certainly a football showdown is certainly a sport where you can you can definitely play kind of nuts but you have to be right about how you're playing nuts and ha and have a big edge whereas like i try and play nuts and i've, I've gotten crushed uh it's i like minus 50 percent crushed but like still like it's it's I, i've had a really hard time turning a profit and you know, maybe this is just the variance of it. And I would imagine that's the case. Like, to be honest with you, like, every, I don't like, I think most of like the people who are successful at showdown are losing 50%, like 95% of the time. So it's like, really just like, you just need that one slate where you're hitting big <laughs> with one of your unique, unique lineups. Yeah, so I'll tell, until that uh, happens. I'll, I'll tell my mom, I'm just one hit away from winning at showdown. I'm sure yeah. she, I'm sure it'll make her comfortable. <laughs> so do you still like uh max out showdown contests or have you kind of you just don't do it no anymore? it's like um platter i think is is better kept dry for stuff you have a grasp of okay yeah makes sense um how do you see the dfs landscape so we, we talked about how like dfs sort of following poker in some ways how do you see the dfs landscape changing going forward 
I think the decline will be a lot slower because um, first off, like, like I said before, it's not completely solvable like poker is. It's more like, you know, these tools will pop up that, that just squish the most recent strategy. So once FC implemented the 4-4, that squished the 4-4 on FanDuel. Yep. Um, so as long as you're ahead of the curve on that kind of stuff, you'll be okay. And I, I think another part of it is like, the people who are redepositing in, in DFS, they're not necessarily getting a bad experience losing. Whereas in poker, you like lose your stack, you're like kind of humiliated. When you're playing against good players, they're constantly like isolating your limps or three betting you light. Uh, like, I don't know if you know that jargon, but like, not really. basically they'll really try and, and play pots versus the bad player. And it becomes a little bit transparent and, um, stuff like that has, has really turned people off from people who are losing off from, from playing, um, poker more than a couple years if, if they're losing. Whereas TFS, like, Look, if I start losing, I'll like probably be excited every football season when it starts. I'll be like, okay, this is my turn, right? Because like, right. there's so much anticipation for it. I, I really have a hard time imagining football ever gets screwed. I mean, maybe the other stuff will, but just because the the field yeah. is so large and soft, like there's so so much casual money in football. Yeah, and and it's it's become like a really big part of our culture in terms of like. Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and and a lot of the content creators, obviously not with you guys at uh, Stochastic, um, you know, they're sort of charlatans and don't know exactly what they're talking about. And they'll only post their wins and not be obvious about their losses and um, generally like don't have a good process. And for the most part, it's just such a big machine and, and football has their tentacles in it so deep that... Um, I'm like not too too worried about it, but um, you know, I guess we'll see. Yeah, could could happen long. Are are you a uh, like a best ball guy at all? Yeah, and I actually referenced best ball to someone I commented to uh, under uh, the thread you started with me. Um, so first off, I I I think best ball is great. Um, part of what makes it so good is there's just only one season. And so like, if you have a good strategy, like you can be years ahead of the competition. And I, I think I've done a relatively, so I, I played, I played last year for the first time and I think I made a bunch of mistakes and it was sort of unavoidable. I just had a strategy and I stuck with it. So for example, I um, was far too aggressive on guys like Gronk and Julio Jones and Will Fuller. So that sunk like, so many of my lineups because yep. the projections I happened to use had them in like 90, 95% of the time. And I don't think those guys really justified it based on their upside. I mean, like Julio was just quite dusty, obviously at that point. And yeah. Gronk at tight end, like you can, you can make tight end work by just drafting three scrubs. But if you draft Gronk and then another player and Gronk's retiring, that just sinks your lineup. Um, I, I, I think best ball right now is a very good example of people playing in a way that makes them comfortable when the edge might not necessarily be there. And one piece of edge I'm willing to give off that I, I think is very good right now that I don't think people are um, exploiting nearly enough is, is simply stacking without quarterback, stacking two receivers without quarterback, because there's so many spots in the NFL right now that have an ambiguous quarterback situation like the Bucks, True. And we saw this last year with both the Dolphins and the Seahawks where, um, I mean, I guess at the time we didn't know two was injury prone, but like you weren't excited to make it to a double stack. Sure. Um, and, and with the Seahawks, with Metcalf and Lockett, um, you, you didn't even know who their quarterback was going to be, but it, it's certainly conceivable that they that they outperformed their expectation by two standard deviations or whatever it was that they did, right? And you don't even need the court. I mean, you can make stacks with the quarterback in other spots. I think for the most part, people would take one of Metcalf or Lockett. Yeah. Um, but chances are they were there were a decent amount of situations where they both failed or they both succeeded, and we actually saw 
the corollary to that with the uh, Broncos, where they send Russell Wilson and everyone failed. Every single last one of their players yep. failed. And last year, the Broncos were playing the Chiefs in week 17, right? Yep. And uh, I'm sure a bunch of people were stacking their Chiefs with Broncos. And that must have sunk a ton of regular season lineups. And I, I think that that meta has gotten overplayed. I'm not really going for the week 17 stack too much because it's it's a little bit obvious. And uh, you can just blow out a team these days and, and, and crush. Like, it's, it's, it's not a huge deal. And when you're stacking last year the Chiefs with the Broncos, this year I think it's the Chiefs with... Bengals. The Bengals? Bengals? Yep. Yeah, so, like, you know, like, if you get... If you get a uh, Kelsey and then you wrap around for uh, Higgins, I mean, like, that's so many people you're competing with. Like, yeah. I don't think that's necessarily a sharp strategy. I mean, sure, if your board works out that way, like, go for it. It's like not a problem. But people being like, "Oh boy, I correlated them. Like, here we go, week seventeen, it's going to happen." I mean, Higgins might be injured. Like, the Chiefs could win fifty-two to seven. Like, there's just all sorts of scenarios that are a lot less comfortable that could easily happen that that people aren't aware of. So so this year specifically I'm I'm playing tons of um Godwin and Evans stacks. Okay. We don't know who the quarterback's going to be, but like they're going to be down a lot. They're in a soft division. These are guys with pedigree and um all we need them is to like do pretty, pretty good. And, and they can be staples of your lineup and, and, and just really carry you to, um, uh, the playoffs. And then, and then if they hit, which like they, they've done it a million times. I mean, they were hitting with Jameis Winston yeah, three years ago, four years ago. Right. Like this is not yeah. something that's completely out of the box. I do think yeah. so. I so I have not been. I, I agree with what you're saying. Like everything you're saying, except that one example. Like I have not drafted many of the Bucks in part because they're just. I'm typically, I think, getting a mid round running back right there, or like there are other wide receivers right there who I draft instead. Which I, I like. I've heard other sharp people say the same thing. Like, oh, they're all in on the Bucks this year, and I probably need to change what I'm doing. But I just, to me, it's like, well, the Bucks. I'm not actually sure about the talent of Mike Evans or Chris Godwin. I like, I don't know how dependent they were on Tom Brady. They're probably more, more talented than I'm, than I'm giving them credit for. So, well, I, I didn't necessarily. So like, I, I tend to be somewhat agnostic about the rankings and, and they just happen to be an example. I was yeah, getting yeah. a decent amount using the rankings, but like the same thing could apply to, you know, choose a team that's like not particularly sexy. I, I can't think of one off the top I mean, of my head. The, the Niners are another one that has like a, an unknown quarterback yep. to some extent. Um, the Falcons to some extent, like I think we, we know mm -hmm. that Desmond Ritter is probably, I, I guess uh, Washington, the commanders, like we don't really know yep. necessarily if Howell is going to be the quarterback. Um, those are, I guess the, the best examples. I actually Miami, I think to some extent is like, well, they've got Tua, but like, I think we're very I'm I'm concerned about the concussions. I don't know if that's a, a common thing, but um somewhat of a concern. But yeah, I think that's um but but going back to your your week 17, like not fully buying in, that's something that I wrestle with a ton. Like I I historically have not cared at all about the week 17 run back. I see all the content about it, and there's a part of me that's like, yeah, maybe I should factor it in a little bit more than I do, which is like very, very little outside of they're probably five week 17 matchups that I actually like have memorized at this point, the, the chiefs Bengals being one of them. Um, but I'm, I don't like have the week 17 games memorized. Cause I'm just like, it's not the highest priority for me. Like it's ranking the things that I care about. It's, it's pretty far down the list. Um, and I think that what you said is a great example of like, well, what if, what if T Higgins gets hurt? Like you're, you're sinking a lot of the, like if, if I'm doing a chief stack, if I'm doing Travis Kelsey with Patrick Mahomes and I don't know if, if, that's not that's not a stack that you can get every time with T Higgins. So it's maybe it's ten percent, but like you're sinking ten percent of those chief stacks. Uh, people who drafted T Higgins if he gets hurt, or even if just like the other players around him, like I don't know Tony Pollard or Chris Olave or who else, whoever else you can draft right there. Even if they just like outperform him significantly, like there are a lot of ways for T Higgins to sink that chief stack. Um, and and you're just cutting out a, a good part of the field as, as you were kind of alluding to. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting point. Uh, I guess a, a sort of a side point to what you were saying in general, though, the, uh, that you don't fully buy into the, the week 17 as like a primary factor. Well, for it's, it's, I definitely buy into it because 
the double stack oppo was like a proven meta for a couple years until it wasn't because people right. were overdoing it so i don't have any data to back this up but i i have a feeling like people pumped it like crazy last year and they haven't stopped this year my impression is um that it's probably overdone at this point um if i were to use it i think i'd be happier using it in like a low cost scenario so like like my my bucks example before say say i had a panthers or a texan stack you know something like that like like the jacks last year being the winner was a good example of it where like yeah i mean you're stacking but like no one's really reaching for that stack and like super forcing the correlation whereas the chief stuff is just screaming off the page everyone's doing it i think it's specifically almost for sure bad and then the other stuff it kind of depends Okay. So it depends on how often people are doing the run back, which yeah, I agree. It's, it's hundred percent dependent on how often people are doing it. And people are, I saw, I think uh, Chad Mashke on Twitter had started tweeting out like a chart of the, the drafts that he's seen, uh, how often the, the bring back is there for players. So it, it really is dependent on how often people are doing it. Um, but to me, it's like, it's just not a primary factor. Like I'm concerned mm-hmm. first and foremost with stacking within my team itself like the the like quarterback with wide receivers. You you also get the bet the entire season, right? Exactly. That's just like like it's not just a week 17 bet. Right. So it's like, yeah, I get it. But also like not everybody does do the bring back in DFS. Like I know uh there are many scenarios where Alex Baker will not do a run back in DFS uh depending on the the exact situation. So it's something well, that's so like, back in the day if you like forced it in an optimizer you would like get stone zero of some teams that were like completely viable just because the bringbacks weren't viable and 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 that's that kind of stuff is so silly right. and it, it goes to show that like using the optimizer incorrectly is like quite bad right yeah you just need to and, and also like there's also the if you if you force it a lot of the time you're just going to get like the wide receiver three for the bring back because they're the one that you can fit in there like if you if you play mm-hmm. like the chiefs in particular like a, an expensive yeah. quarterback stack and if you do like the if you want your your uh your Patrick Mahomes with Kelsey and back in the day, Tyree kill. Like it was like, that's very expensive. So you're always going to get like the wide receiver three for the other team. And it's like, that might not actually make sense. Um, so I don't know. There, there's a lot of factors that go into whether it's a good idea to do a bring mm-hmm. back. And, and I think it sounds like we're on the same page. It's like, yeah, it's generally, it's a good thing to have a bring back. Like you do want the entire game to go off. You want to limit the number of things you need to get right. But like, you also need to be cognizant of the, like what you're giving up to, to do it, I think. Um, but anyway, sure. uh, because you were talking about uh, NFL, I, I'm, I'm glad I brought up basketball because I wasn't sure that you did it, um, but I'm, I'm glad that I brought it up because that's uh, it's a good good little pointer there for uh, for basketball. Um, I also so you say in your your uh, Twitter bio that you are a 15 time live. I, I'm guesstimating there. I okay. could be a touch higher low. Okay, but I don't know. I've done this for eight years. I feel like I've made more than two a year. Okay. And what, what is your two this year? What uh what what is your reasoning for going after those live finals? Winner take all is just good. Okay. Um, it's like I I mentioned this before. We're at the rake, right? I I didn't think DFS was beatable because the rake was too high. Well, if you make the entire contest first, they rake they rake those things a lot, but they still end up being okay for me. And uh, I mean, yeah. the experience is whatever, but you know. It's a good time, I suppose. Do Do you always go to the live final? Have you ever like skipped one that you made? No, I've I've sent some friends a few times. I've gone myself a few times. It's especially like if if they'll be back to back one week versus the next. Sure. Uh, I'll usually only go to one. Do you send like your your IRL friends or like your DFS friends? Uh, mostly IRL. I don't I don't have too many okay. DFS friends. Okay, I mean, you and I are in a Discord together, so I know you. You at least talk to some. Yeah, some but DFSers. like, I don't know. Jesse could walk into the room right now. What would I wouldn't even know what he looks like? That's true. <laughs> DFS acquaintances, I guess. I All guess I know is like, he would complain. He would definitely complain. Hundred percent chance yeah, that Jesse was just running bad about. being in my presence. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, who? Uh, so, so have you been to uh, DFS live finals for both DraftKings and FanDuel? Mm-hmm. Who? Uh, what's your preference? Who? Who do you think throws a better party? Um, I hate to say it because I'm not a huge fan of their, uh, operating officers, et cetera, but probably DraftKings. 
I've never been to a FanDuel uh, live final, so I really have no comparison there. Um, yeah. If you get a ticket to a live final, I guess maybe this doesn't, since, since you don't even always go to the live final, I guess the experience itself is not the most important thing for you. But I would, uh, if you get a ticket to a live final, are you inclined to go after more tickets to the same event or like, you know, because part of the value in getting the ticket is the actual like experience is like going. And then it's like every ticket you get after that, like, well, you already have the experience. So it doesn't add that much. Well, they give you it. cash. Oh, do they give you cash? I did not realize I don't that. think they give it for the experience, but they give it for like travel costs. I mean, maybe they give it for the experience. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'm probably slightly more inclined to chase it if I've made it because okay. It's just more convenient to cluster my uh, tickets around fewer trips. Sure. So Makes like, sense. say it's been like four fifths of the season. And I haven't banked yet. I might just stop trying to chase because if I need to make plans last minute, blah, 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 blah. It's like maybe a little annoying. Okay. So you're more inclined to go after them once you have one already. Interesting. Slightly. Okay. Yeah. Um, I already asked you the uh, one of our listener cues. Then we had another one from uh, Alex Baker. He said, Vinny Vici, and you you already kind of alluded to this. Vinny Vici 9586 yeah. was a legendary poker play back in the day. My question is, if he still shows off his poker graph, because is this something you showed off on Twitter? Or like, where where did you show your poker graph? This is like back in the poker forums in, the, in the olden days. Uh, I had like a very particular style that where I was playing lower stakes than I should have been playing. I was playing tighter than I should have been playing. So like I essentially had like almost no downswings whatsoever. So my graph would be like basically like this. Nice. Just straight up. Um, and chances are if you're doing that, you're making a mistake because you should be chasing more edge at higher stakes. Uh, but yeah, they were they were definitely unique graphs for sure at the time. <laughs> um, probably cost me some money to have such pretty graphs. I should maybe change them into nfts and try and sell them to recoup that but <laughs> but that was also because you were playing like cash games so, like I, I look at uh jordan cooper blenderheads graphs for dfs and his are are more like that like it's obviously not exactly like a just straight upward line but it seems like flatter than most of us doesn't have like the you know roller coaster mm -hmm. to the same extent do you think it's partially just because you are playing like those cash games where it's... oh it's 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 definitely a cash game specific thing tournaments and in, in poker they're gonna you're gonna be bleeding buy-ins and then okay. hit bleeding yeah, buy-ins yeah. similar to dfs kind of thing. yeah yeah okay um all right so you, you you don't show that off anymore i think you uh you, you answered on twitter you're no. not doing the graphs anymore how about your your roto tracker graphs or your, your dfs graphs you, you've never been one to show those either have you that's not really a thing people do too often is it i, I i've not seen it a, a bit recently and i i support touts doing that because I think you should at least be like somewhat transparent, right? Um, about about how you're doing. Um, no, just because I don't know. Right. <laughs> it's I mean, like you're right. It's it's not that important to me. And like in in DFS, you're you're gonna instantly get doom switched if you uh, like bad luck is instantly gonna come if you post that because like. <laughs> chances are you're going to lose and go on a downswing immediately. I mean, chances I'm going to play today. I'm at any given time. Yeah. Probably that's, gonna that's lose. Chances are yeah. probably going to lose today. Right. That's true. Not looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let's, let's try to win it today. Um, all right. That is, that is basically all of the questions that I have lined up, except for, uh, I always ask this one at the end, tell me about your favorite win or win celebration. Oh boy. You can do multiple too if if there are a couple that are close. No, I can't whatever. even come up with one favorite win. Um, oh, I had a good one way back in the day, twenty fourteen or oh, no, it must have been fifteen at that point or sixteen, sixteen. <laughs> um, it was the Heat's last game of the season with, I believe, they're like Dion Waiters crew. And they had just missed out on the playoffs, or maybe it was a couple of years before that. Anyways, they just missed out on the playoffs, and um, this was like before projections were good. But um, I knew we were going to play like one of the tightest rotations ever, so I had Michael Beasley in the small forward spot because we were tanking, and he played lit. We played 
I believe every player 46 minutes, except for Haslam, who got like 16, because at the time he was like 36, which is still quite old to play basketball. Right. Um, and people just weren't in tune with that kind of stuff at the time. And and I, I was just like all over the leaderboard, just my heat read was spot on and Michael Beasley was all over the place. And, uh, you know, at the time, the money meant more to me than it does now. So right. uh, I was I was quite excited about it. And um, it was a nice way to end the season. And doing it with your own team, too. That's kind of fun. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I do have a pretty good read on my team overall. It's The Heat are unfortunately not super actionable for the most part. They're um, yeah. not a ton of super high sitting guys, um, but, you know, they're they're good sweat. True, true. Well, that is, I mean, that that is does sound like a fun win. Um, I, I guess you have several that you had to, to choose from there, but I, I that's a good one from from way back when. That's a an early yeah. days big win. That's fun. Was that one? Of, was that one of your first like big wins in DFS, or had you had some success already at that point? That was that was one of my first really good days in basketball. I'd I'd won in other sports at that point, and basketball, I I, I kept on. Um, I was overthinking it. So I would like upload basketball monster, which was like the projection site back in the day. Yep. And then I would change things all over the place because I was like paranoid that um, I was just going to be duplicating with people. But at the time there was just a lot of money in it and I should have just let the cruncher do its thing, let it ride. And if you duplicate a little, it's like not really a big deal. Right. Nice. Well, uh, Vince, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, where can people find you? Uh, Tinderella DFS on Twitter. I don't post too often, but um, yeah, I'm there. Uh, occasionally, passively, aggressively liking tweets, and <laughs> that's about it. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tinderella, for coming on High Stakes episode 38. Thank you very much to Mike Lawrence for producing, as always. Uh, again, you can find Vince on Twitter at Tinderella DFS. You can find Mike on Twitter at Awesome Yo. You can find me on Twitter at PlayerQ DFS. Thank you guys very much for listening. You'll be able to catch High Stakes episode 39 two weeks from today, Friday, uh, middle of the day on the Stochastic YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. Catch you next time. Thanks, guys.